we pray. Amen. It seems a little strange to say, but it needs to be saying, and that was Pastor Larry DeMoss. <laughs> um, some of you don't know him. Uh, he shepherded our church for 12 years, and he's had several other assignments over the last six. I've been here six and a half almost. Isn't that nuts? Um, but he's uh, resting for a little while, a couple months off before he's trying to figure out, he and Jane, whether or not their next assignment is. They've been taking short-term churches with pa without pastors, um, so they've been doing that. When you hang out with Pastor Larry, it's like, uh, it's like uh, soaking in a hot tub of grace. Mm. Next week, Lord willing, uh, Dan Smith uh, is the executive pastor of North Platte Berean, and he's going to be coming, and he'll be preaching, and I'll be here all week this week, and I'll be here on Sunday next Sunday, but I kind of need a little soak in the hot tub of grace uh, this week. And so, um, yeah, uh, he'll be preaching on Sunday, and he'll be good because he's a very good teacher. I'd like to welcome those of you who are um, listening and those of you who are watching on the worldwide internets, um, I made that up, I don't know. Glad you're watching, and I pray that you'll be encouraged. Uh, we're coming from lots of different places today, but the Lord's word is going to speak to us. Let's jump right in. So which word describes you? Put several words on the screen here, and uh, probably describes you today, maybe this week, last week. Um, if you're doing good today, that's okay, I'm great, that's great, but... Uh, the Lord has something for you. So maybe you're confused right now. What's going on? I don't understand my circumstances, the Lord. Maybe you're doubting. God, it just seems like you're really far away right now. What's going on? Or maybe you're weary. You're weary. You're tired. This word uh, that we're going to be looking at in Isaiah 50 just goes right to you who are weary. Maybe you're mistreated. Maybe you're misunderstood. Maybe you're being slandered. Well, Today we've got something for you as well. Discouraged, discouraged, everything just seems to be falling apart. Troubled, afraid. Now, there's been a word that we've been looking at just the last couple of weeks. Um, it's the Hebrew word for listen, for listen. And it's the word shema, shema. Now, the word in Hebrew, shema, it can refer just to simply hearing something, like I heard the music. But whenever it's referring to the Lord, it's something more than just hearing. Shema, when it comes to God's voice, is to listen, but not just to listen, to listen and follow, or to listen and obey. To listen and follow, and to listen and obey. There are many times where my children hear my voice, but they don't actually shema. Does this make sense? And there are many times where I actually hear God's voice, but I don't really shema because it doesn't result in any change in my heart and I don't, or is any result in change in my actions or any following in him. So the Lord wants us to shema him. Now this is word is most famous in a prayer that Jewish people say almost every single day from Deuteronomy chapter six. Uh, and it starts with the word, hear, O Israel, shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, today we're going to go through and we're going to see all of these references to listening. Many times it is the Hebrew word shema. Okay, tune in, y'all. If you're confused or you're doubting or you're weary or you're mistreated or you're discouraged or you're troubled or you're afraid, shema is a huge part of the solution. Shema to the Lord's voice. Now, it may not make immediate sense, but just let it sink in for a minute. If you're discouraged... Why would it be important to Shema to listen to and follow the Lord? If you're mistreated, it's important for you to Shema to hear and to follow God's voice. If you're afraid, if you're afraid, he's got words he wants to speak to you. Listen and follow him. You can trust him. Now, we're going to start with the word confused, because this is where Israel is. God's people in the Old Testament, they've been ignoring God. They've been doing the exact opposite of Shema. They, they maybe hear and they go the opposite direction or they just plain old ignore. And so God has said to his people in the Old Testament as we go through the book of Isaiah that 
He's going to allow them to be taken over by this foreign army called the Babylonians, and they're really confused. And one of the verses that we read last week, I'm going to put it on the screen, is from Isaiah chapter 49. It's a verse of confusion, and this is what Israel says to the Lord, Isaiah 49 and verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Your circumstances just seem crazy. You're all confused by this. Now, that word forsake, it can mean to abandon, but a lot of times it has like the idea of divorce. Israel is like, are are we getting a divorce from the Lord? Is the Lord divorcing us? And they feel really confused by this. The impending Babylonian exile, it's confused the Israelites. Was God divorcing them? Was he going to abandon them and forsake them? Okay, let's turn to God's word. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1. God starts to answer this question specifically as it has to do with him forsaking them or abandoning them or even divorcing them. So if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1, if you didn't bring a Bible, we'd love for you to read along. Uh, We have black Bibles in the chairs in front of you. And it's page 611. And if you, need, if you need one, take it. If you know someone who needs one, give it to them. So God's going to speak a word to us who are confused, who are discouraged, who are weary, who are mistreated. In his word, through the prophet Isaiah, as he speaks to Israel, he's also wanting to speak to us because he's a living God and his word is living and active. All right, so they're confused. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold. By the way, that's a poetic word for sin. For your sin you were sold. And for your transgressions, that word could be translated rebellions. For your rebellions and transgressions, your mother was sent away. Lord, it seems like you're divorcing us. Why am I going through difficult stuff here? And God is saying, if I really did divorce you, Israel, go read the certificate. Find out why. Or do you really think I owed another God some money so that I had to sell you to repay them? That's what he's saying here. God is saying somewhat sarcastically, ah, which of my creditors is it for which I have sold you, Israel? Well, you know what? Marduk and I, we had a friendly bet. Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, right? And we had a friendly bet, and Yahweh lost. And so I've got to pay up, and I'm going to go ahead, and I owe Marduk some money here. He's being sarcastic. But he's saying, no, why am I allowing you to be conquered by the Babylonians? Well, look at verse 1 again. Why did God allow Israel to be conquered by Babylon? Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, here's the reason. For your iniquities, your sins you were sold, and for your transgressions, your mother was sent away. So, It was not because of a lack of love for Israel, divorce, or a lack of power, like some other God was more powerful and God owed them, that God allowed his people to be conquered. It was because of their sin. It was because of their sin. Now, there's an interesting question here. Did God permanently divorce Israel? It's actually a really interesting question, all right? But uh, you're just going to have to hang on to the rest of Isaiah, but let me just give you a hint. Two more times in the book of Isaiah, God uses wedding imagery with his people. So even though they've cheated on him and they pushed him away a bunch of times, God is going to invite them back and woo them back, all right? God still has a plan for his people. It's going to be through his servant Messiah, Jesus, but he still has a plan for them. It's not because of lack of love that they're going to go to Babylon, not because God lacked power, it's because of their sin. Let me define sin for you. Let me define sin for you. Sin is loving something more than God. Sin is loving something more than God. It's not simply breaking rules. It's not simply breaking the rules. Why do we break the rules? Because we think something else can give us happiness and joy and complete fulfillment and satisfaction apart from the living God. God, uh, uh, The Gospel of John says it this way. um, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light. It wasn't simply breaking the Ten Commandments. Why do we break the Ten Commandments? We don't think God is satisfying. We don't love him. We love other things more than him. And because of that, 
God will allow difficulties to happen, but he's constantly, again, just like Israel, he's trying to bring us back here. So confused, confused, the Lord is doing this in order to bring Israel back and to, uh, to help them to see the consequences of their sin. Doubting, doubting. Lord, what are you doing? Verse 2. Now the Lord is speaking in verse 2. Why, when I came, this is the Lord speaking, why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Now, the Lord is accusing Israel here of not listening. Why, when I called, look at my hands. So he's, he's speaking, but they're not Shema. They're not Shema-ing. Made that into an English word. He's accusing them of not listening. I called through the prophets. I've spoken through my word. No one's answered. No one's followed. Now let's keep going. Let's take a run at it. Verse 2, why when I came was there no man? Why when I called was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem or that I have no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. So why didn't they listen? God says, well, maybe, maybe you thought I was too weak. My hands were so short. I had T-Rex arms. I don't know if you've ever seen that before or not. But God wasn't really able to help out Israel because he's kind of weak and powerless. God is saying, so did you not listen and follow because you thought I wasn't powerful enough? Did you think I, I wasn't really powerful enough to help you? Now look at the examples that he uses here. He's talking about the exodus when they faced in front of them the Red Sea, an ocean. And behind them was the most powerful army in the world. And God's hand, his arm, was not too short to save. He led them through. Now notice very closely. Notice very closely. God isn't just giving a history lesson here. He says he is still the God who is active today in delivering his people. So important. We need to know how God has acted in history because it's the same God. Now, he may move in different ways, but he's still in the business of accomplishing his will for his glory and delivering his people for his glory. Look at verse 2 again. Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. They're fish. They stink for lack of water. The fish die of thirst. Meanwhile, I control the heavens. I, ca- I clothe the heavens with blackness. I make sackcloth their covering. If God is not still living and active today, we need to close our doors because we don't need more history lessons. We don't need more religious social clubs. He is alive Now, there's so much sin and difficulty and pain in our lives, we often have to turn our eyes up to him, but that's what he's saying right here. Listen, listen for my voice. But when we're in difficulty, when we're in that situation where it's the Red Sea in front of us and the army behind us, we doubt. We doubt. Well, I know God delivered that last time, but surely I'm the first person in human history. Surely I'm the first person in human history who God's not going to take care of. My situation is the first situation in human history that's too big for God. We all believe that lie. I'm tempted by that lie when difficulty faces me. I don't want to minimize the pain and the grief of difficulty. But Satan wants to whisper into your ear, say, well, God can't get this one. He's got, he's got T-Rex arms. He can't help you. Do you really think your situation is too big for God? And the answer is, yeah, I sometimes do, which is why I need to hear his voice and remember how huge, how powerful he is. Okay, now there's a subject change in verse 4 because it says the Lord God has given me. So we need to figure out who the me is here, all right? Verse 4, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. So who is this talking about? Okay, so as we be going through the book of Isaiah, God introduces uh, this future character, and he speaks in somewhat vague terms at first. But as you go through Isaiah, you start to learn more and more about this future person. He's called Emmanuel. He will be born of a virgin. 
He starts in chapter 42 being called the servant, the servant of the Lord. And that's exactly who it's talking about right here. Last week, we learned that Simeon, Simeon was in the temple when he, when he saw the baby Jesus. He quoted Isaiah 49, and he says, this is the servant we've been waiting for. So in Isaiah 50 and verse 4, it's talking about Jesus. Now, with that in mind, let's read it again. And I'm going to put Jesus in here to help us to see what it's predicting. Verse 4, the Lord God has given Jesus the tongue of those who are taught, that Jesus may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens, he, the Father awakens Jesus' ear to hear as those who are taught. So the servant here is Jesus Christ, and the servant listens to and he follows God's voice, the Lord's voice, the Father's voice every single day day. Jesus Christ listens to and follows. He shamas. He's the only one who's perfectly shema, God, in the flesh. He perfectly listens to and follows God the Father's will. Listens to his voice every single day. Okay, so we have an example of this in uh, the Gospels. We have Luke chapter 5 on the screen. Now notice, this is important. Great, and here's what it says about Jesus. Great crowds gathered to hear Jesus. So there's all these crowds all around him. And to be, uh, they came, these crowds came to be healed of their infirmities. So it sounds like a busy guy, Jesus. I mean, his popularity is soaring through the roof. Do you know what he does? He would withdraw to a desolate place and pray. Jesus is so busy, he had to get away and pray. Now, I know that didn't make sense to you, did it, right? Listen closely. Jesus was so busy that he had to get away and pray. It doesn't make any sense to our do, 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 achieve culture. And yet, Jesus knew that the highest achievement he could ever do was to do the will of the Father and to be in dependent intimacy with him. And Jesus also knew that popularity or people's needs would press in too much. And his number one job was to hear from the Father and be in dependent intimacy with the Father. He was so busy, he had to get away to pray. That doesn't make any sense. Well, Jesus, you're, you know, there's people right there who are going to be healed. And Jesus says, well, in other words, he knows his first priority is to be with the Father, to be with the Father. All right. Now, the servant, he, he speaks God's words. Jesus speaks God's very words. Look at verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught. So he says he's speaking God's very words. How does he know what God the Father says? Well, we know that Jesus is fully God himself, and yet in his full humanity, it's a mystery, but he had to spend time in prayer hearing from the Lord. If you're not familiar with this idea, John talks about it, the Gospel of John. It's on the screen. And Jesus says this, For I have not spoken on my own authority. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So Jesus speaks the very words of God the Father. And he listens every day for the Father's voice to know what to say, to know when to say it, and to know when to get away from the crowds and to spend time with the Father. Super important. Super important. So he speaks God's words. And now, God's words, the servant's words, they sustain the weary. I love this. Verse 4 the Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Are you weary? The Lord's speaking to you. Come to me. Come to me all who labor. Some versions say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus is saying this to you right now, today. You think you need to achieve more and accomplish more. He says, no, come to me and listen. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. See, you've been trying to get stuff done in your own yoke, and the Lord says, no, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your weary souls. Our job is not to do more and achieve more, it's to walk with God and to come to him and move in his strength because he sustains the weary. He sustains the weary. He wants to speak to you right now in your 
weariness. And your job is to shema, to listen to and follow Jesus. We all need to regularly slow down to hear God's voice. We all need to regularly slow down to hear God's voice. If Jesus, being fully God, had to slow down and hear God's voice, what does it say about you and I who are sinners and forget really quickly? We too need to slow down and hear God's voice, and God wants to draw near to us. He does draw near to us. Our job is to slow down and listen. I'm reading through the Gospel of Matthew right now, and I've been struck how many times Jesus says the following words, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Think about that. It's a very Hebrew way of thinking. He's saying, Shema! Shema! Did I break anyone's speaker on TV? Email me, okay? Shema! He who has ears to hear, listen to my voice. And then he says in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they, they go accomplish a bunch of stuff. Wait, that's not what he says. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They follow me. See, accomplishing a bunch of stuff makes you weary. But walking with Jesus, that also at times makes you weary, but he also replenishes your strength as you listen to him over and over and over and over again. This is the servant. All right, verse five, more about the servant. The Lord God has opened my ear, the servant says, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. He says, I'm hearing the Father and I'm doing what the Father says. He says this in John chapter five on the screen. Jesus said to them, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the son does likewise. So Jesus, his job was to accomplish the will of the Father for the glory of the Father, but he had to slow down and hear, Lord, how fast should I move? Lord, what is your agenda? Lord, who should I speak to? He followed God's path perfectly. In Jesus' humanity, he had to listen to the Father's voice every day, and he's the only one who perfectly obeyed the Father. I love that. In Jesus' humanity, he had to listen to the Father's voice. Again, this is a mystery. We aren't sure. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what it looked like for Jesus being fully God and fully human. We don't, know the, we don't know exactly how much Jesus knew because God the Father knows everything. So was his, was, his, was his knowledge somewhat limited by his humanity for a short time? Well, it seems to be that he had to listen to the Father to know, to, and he had to listen to the Holy Spirit. So even though he was fully God in the deep mystery, right here it's clear. He's trying to hear the Father's voice and obey him, and he obeys perfectly. Here's why that's important, okay? You can't pay God back for your sins, okay? A lot of people believe the idea that um, it, you, at the end of the day, God's going to, like at the end of your life, you've got the scale, and, and if your good things outweigh your bad things, you get to go to heaven. But that's insulting to a holy God, because he's so holy, he can't countenance sin whatsoever. Sin must be paid for. And you can't pay for it because every effort you do is tainted with sin. Every effort you do is tainted with sin apart from the Holy Spirit. And yet here is the son, the servant, perfectly obeying the father. So therefore, he is the perfect, unblemished lamb of God. And when he dies on the cross, he dies for your sins so that you can know the way to the father. So the way to be made right with the Father is not by trying harder or doing more or having your good outweigh your bad. It's through the perfect Son who perfectly obeyed. Now here's the wild part. When you trust in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, God takes his account, his righteousness, his, Jesus' holiness, and he credits, credits it to you. Grace. Grace. He's the only one who perfectly obeyed. So today, today, God wants to draw you near, and your job is to receive Jesus, to, to walk with him, to trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. That's how you become a Christian. It's not a magic trick of getting baptized or learning the right religious prayer. It's trusting in Jesus. By grace, you are saved through faith. That's for the weary. So like Jesus, God is calling all of us to Shema. He's calling all of us to Shema the Lord's voice every single day. I'm hoping this week to spend extra time just soaking in God's voice this week. Mistreated, verse six. This is again the, 
This is again the uh, servant, verse 6. The servant says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. So here's the thing. Notice carefully, the servant perfectly hears the father's voice and follows the father's voice. And what does it lead to? Suffering and shame. Well, no, I mean, no, that's not victorious. Okay, well, because we broke everything, Jesus has to undergo suffering and shame in order to fix everything and bring us back to the Father. That's what it's saying right here. Now, this is an important truth. God uses suffering for his glory. And when you obey, there will be difficulties. And here the servant has the same thing. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. See, the servant will listen to and obey the father even if it means suffering. And he knew it would mean suffering. He listens to and obeys the father even though it means suffering. So if you are misunderstood, if you are mistreated, if you are being slandered, draw near to Jesus. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like. And he's going to show you the heart of the Father in deeper measure, in deeper measure as you draw near to him because others oppress you or oppose you. He wants to show you the heart of the Father. He knows what it's like. And yet it says in the book of Hebrews, he was without sin. He can give you his strength, his perspective, and even deeper intimacy with the Father. Now it talks more about how Jesus trusts even in suffering, verse 7. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? This is the servant trusting in God, even in suffering. Let us stand up together. Who's my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The servant says. Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. So even in his suffering, Jesus listens to and he follows God's plans because he knows that the only way to redeem our brokenness is to join in the brokenness and bring glory and hope from the brokenness through the cross. So Jesus meditated on the truth that God would um, turn his suffering into glory and defeat those who opposed him. Jesus meditated on the truth Even when he knew he was about to undergo an unbelievably excruciating death, he meditated, and it says in Hebrews, on the joy that was set before him. He knew that God was going to take this and use it for his glory. He listened. In fact, that's what he does in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's pouring out his heart and he's in anger because for the only time in history, he does, he's separated from the dependent intimacy with the Father. He knows that's about to happen on the cross. And yet he says, not my will, but your will be done. Because he lives for the Father's glory. And he knows that the Father is going to defeat those who oppose him. Now, if you're discouraged, if you're discouraged, verse 10 has to speak to you. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness, discouragement, and has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled, this you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Okay, so let's talk about these verses. Verse 10. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? All right, tune in, y'all. The word obey there is the Hebrew word shema. See, it's hard to translate into English because it has the idea of not just listening, but listening and following. English translators in the ESV just said obey, obey the voice of of the servant, Jesus. So when we're discouraged, obey, follow, listen to the voice of Jesus. It's the Shema, to listen to and to follow Jesus' lead, the servant here. And God will provide light. So you're in darkness. Trust in him. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. So God's light is his strength. God's light is his plan and his path. 
So when you, God will provide light for your path and your job is to listen and to trust. Listen and to follow. Listen and to obey. That's God's light. All right. Now verse 11 is a contrast, okay? So God offers you his light, but verse 11, behold all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire, this is sarcasm, and by the torches you have kindled. So God says, I'm offering you my light, my strength, my plan. But some of you, when you reject it, you're basically saying, yeah, God, I'd rather use my own flashlight here. I'd rather use my own torch. I'm just going to go ahead and trust in my plan and my path. That's a warning. Walking in your own light, walking in your own strength, walking in your own path, your own plan, it leads to destruction. It says at the end of verse 11, this you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Now, to be clear, I don't think Isaiah here is thinking purely in terms of heaven and hell, all right? He's not thinking purely in terms of heaven and hell. He's thinking more in terms of wisdom, that when you walk in God's light and follow his light, there's, there's health and there's flourishing. But when you, don't walk in God's, when you don't walk in God's light, there is destruction. Now, if you keep rejecting the Lord, if you never trust in Jesus, there is, yes, eternal destruction, absolutely. But it's possible even to trust in Jesus and to go to heaven, and yet your life, it hasn't amounted to much, and you keep banging your head into the, into the wall because you're going in your strength and your own plan leads to destruction. Destruction. All right. Now let's talk about those who are troubled. So they're struggling because, uh, well, they've trusted the Lord. Some people in Israel have trusted the Lord. The majority of the Israelites have not trusted the Lord. So he's about to speak to those few, the small remnant, who are still trusting in the Lord, and yet because of the people's unfaithfulness, they're going to have to undergo difficulty of the exile and difficulty of conquest. They're troubled by this. So look what the Lord says, verse 1. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. In other words, they're still trying to follow the Lord. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one, Abraham, when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places. He makes Zion's wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. So they're troubled because it's like, I'm the only one left here, Lord. Will you bring anything good of my life? We're going to have to go through a bunch of difficulty. And he says, no, look and listen. Listen. Actually, the very first word of verse 51. Okay, bonus points for anyone who knows what it is in Hebrew. Oh, thank you. All right. Some of you are tuned in. It's very, yeah, okay. That word right there is Shema. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock. Things are difficult but look to the rock, be like Abraham, be like Sarah. Listen here is Shema, to listen and to follow. Look to Abraham and Sarah who trusted that God would keep his promises despite the circumstances. Okay, let's talk about Abraham and Sarah. Maybe you're not familiar with that story. There's a story uh, in the beginning of the Bible about this man called Abraham. And Abraham isn't like, God wasn't looking around the world and be like, oh, I wonder who the most godly person in the world is so that I can really bless them. Oh, Abraham. Because that's how God, he's smarmy. God talks like that. You don't know the word smarmy, apparently. Um, so God looks around. He doesn't, he, Abraham's worshiping other gods. He's worshiping other gods. And yet God picks him out and says, I'm going to bless you, follow me. I'm going to bless you. But Abraham's like, uh, I'm old, Lord. And not only that, my wife, she's also old. And she's never, even when she wasn't old, she wasn't able to have kids. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you descendants. I'm going to multiply your offspring. And Abraham's like, I'm not sure. See, the circumstances, God, would seem to dictate otherwise. Not sure you can pull through on this one, God. And so God takes him outside. And he says, look. Look to the heavens. What do you see? And Abraham's like, I see stars. And the Lord says, if you can number those stars, that's how many descendants I'm going to give to you and your offspring. Okay, so Abraham is to look to the stars and it's to give him faith. Now, interestingly, in verses uh, 1 and 2 here, 
the same word in Hebrew is used here, look. So when you're struggling with your circumstances, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father. As Abraham looked at the stars, you look at how God kept his promises in the past because he still today keeps his promises. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. So even if God calls you to a difficult path, and very difficult circumstances, he is going to take and multiply spiritually your life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make you a blessing. He wants, to, he wants you to bear much fruit as you listen to and follow him. Now verse 4. This is again weary. For those who are weary, verse 4. Give attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation. The word Shema is not there right now, but it's the same idea. Give attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. So for those of us who are weary, look. Verse 4, give attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation. A law will go out from me. I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. Look at verse 5. My righteousness draws near. Oh, thinking about me having to draw near to God in some way, work my, that's exhausting. But he makes the first move. He says, my righteousness draws near. Earlier, earlier we learned that his servant, the Messiah, is going to be called Emmanuel, God with us. God doesn't wait for us to fix our mess and clean up our problems. We can't. He's the one who draws near Emmanuel. So God promises to draw near and he promises to rescue. It's this arm imagery through his servant Jesus. Now, where are you getting that, Tice? Where is it talking about the servant? Okay. Well, verse 4, it says that the law will go out from him and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. Now, earlier in Isaiah 42, it talks about the servant. And it says that the servant, the law, will go out from his mouth, the law being the very word of God. From the servant will go out the law. And it says also in that same verse, Isaiah 42 and verse 4, that the servant is going to establish justice. So that's exactly what it's talking about. God promises to draw near when we're weary. And he promises to rescue through his servant Jesus. But, verse 4, we must listen, give attention for God's promises. Give attention to his instruction. Now, this is where we're going to close, verses 7 and 8, to those who are afraid. Afraid, verse 7. Listen. Are you tired of that word? Are you tired of it? Me too, but it's a good one. Shema. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But My righteousness will be forever, and my salvation will be to all generations. So, listening to and following God's voice, help us to overcome people's disapproval. We all have fear of man. We all have someone we want to impress, or we're worried that they'll reject us. But then the the solution to that, the antidote to that is to hear God's voice, to hear God's voice. Because he wants to say to you, You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. With you I am well pleased. He wants grace for you. He wants your your identity to be as his son instead of having to be a people pleaser. And the way we do that is to listen and to follow his voice. That helps us to overcome people's disapproval because the oppression of people, it's only temporary. It says in verse 8, the moth will eat them up like a garment and the worm will eat them like wool, but... My righteousness will be forever, and my salvation will be to all generations. God's voice reminds us that people's opposition, it's momentary. Even if people oppose you for 10 years, or maybe even 20, it's momentary. 
Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. God's kingdom is forever. And one day, one day you will see him. You will see God face to face. He will wipe your tears. So set your eyes on what is eternal. Now what is here is difficult and God wants you to bring his, his love to the places around you here. But don't set your eyes permanently there. Keep looking to Jesus in your difficulty and even in those who oppose you. Okay, so three takeaways. Real quick, they're not in your bulletin. How do I shema? We've covered this before, but let's cover it again. Number one, slow down. The biggest opposition for Americans and for Tice Jensen is that I don't slow down to hear God's voice. So the number one thing for hearing God's voice is to slow down. Second thing is to meditate. Not just read once in the morning, but to let God's word dwell in your heart richly throughout the day. Meditate throughout the day on his word and his truth. Set your eyes on spiritual reality because life is difficult. Third thing is be with God's people in intentional relationships. Give, uh, there's others in the body of Christ who will strengthen you, who will speak God's word to you to keep your eyes on him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you're patient. Lord, help. I pray that you would help me to become a better listener. And I pray that you would help this people to become a listening people in deeper measure. We have many amazing listeners, but you want to call them deeper? And we have many here who don't listen well, and you want to call them deeper too. So I pray that our church should be a church that listens and follows your lead. And you receive so much glory in central Nebraska and around the world because we listen and follow you. So help us to hear your voice today and this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close out the service today. And um, we're closing with a blessing that the Lord gave Moses for the Israelites. And what I'd like us to do when we